So a couple of years ago at DevCon, uh, a good colleague asked me a question. Why are you here? And I immediately started answering his question, but he stopped me and said, no, 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 why are you here? And that made me think, and I came to the conclusion the reason I'm here is because I want to share my knowledge and experiences. And hopefully I'll be able to accomplish that in this session. Uh, and that's also the reason why I'm bold enough to stand in front of you and speak to you about legislation, even though I'm not a lawyer. Um, I've been working with this for uh, almost two years now, and uh, I have helped several of our clients to get compliant with the uh, GDPR. Um, so I want to share some of the uh, experiences in that process. So my name is Klaus Lavinz. and I'm really happy to see that a few of you turned up. Uh, if you're here to, uh, to really listen in, then uh, sharpen your ears because there's going to be a lot of information and I'm going to be speaking a lot and maybe a bit fast as well. Uh, if you're here to sleep, uh, take a nap, then tug in now, okay? So I'm from Denmark in uh, Europe. I run a consultant business called Datamanix, and I've been around uh, the platform for 24 years now. Um, so let's get started. First, I want to uh, give you a historic uh, insight into why GDPR came along. Uh, then I'm going to talk about the ins and outs of GDPR. And finally, I'm going to talk about the business opportunities it brings to FileMaker developers like yourself. Um, I have to put a disclaimer, I'm not a lawyer. What I tell you in this session is not something you can use in court, as all legislation comes down into interpretation in court, okay? So now we got that. So let's start with a little background. Um, during Second World War and the Nazi regime, it was clear to the world that there were a need for some fundamental human rights. So the Allies sat down and agreed upon that after the war that they needed to uh, draw up a human convention. So that was the reason for doing the European Human Rights Convention which were drawn up in 1950 and came into force in 53. Now that sounds like an awful long time after the war, but all legislation takes time and it takes time before it can go into force. So it's really not that long. So the idea of the uh, human rights, uh, the fundamental human rights is that, um, that it should apply to all. And one of those fundamental human rights is a right to have privacy. That has been implemented in legislation throughout the years. So we all know, for example, that a mailed letter you cannot open unless it's addressed to you because of the mail secrecy. We have the right to have privacy. Unfortunately, this has become lost in the digital world. Uh, for example, in Denmark, the latest privacy law revol uh, revolving in digital rights was from 1995. I don't know how clear 95 stands in your uh, memory, but that was the time where the internet was brand new and uh, we all connected with dial-up modems. Well, at least the ones who had a computer at home and even fewer had a, an internet connection. The hottest browser at that time were Netscape Navigator. So a lot has changed since that. And that's the reason for the lawmakers in EU to sit down and say, now it's time to give this fundamental human right back to the people. So why should you care if you're from US? Oh, sorry, I need to say something else before, because what are we talking about with the GDPR? It stands for General Data Protection Regulation, and it's covering any personal information about a human being, if you are alive, at least. Dead people don't uh, have rights in terms of GDPR, but living people have. And they have to be residents of EU in order for the GDPR to apply. 
Uh, it's covering information in the digital world, but it also covers the information on paper. Luckily, it's not about th stuff in your brain, at least yet. So what does it mean? It means that we don't own personal data. We have had the assumption that when we are a company and we got uh, personal information collected in our systems, we would be the owner of this data. No way. And we have to change that thinking. We don't own personal data. And GDPR clearly states that the owner of the personal data is the individual. So we are borrowing personal data for a specific use for a specific time frame. And we have to change our thinking about personal data to this. It's just like if you borrow a car, okay? So let's say this is a, a Let's say this is uh, Dominique's car, and I want to, to borrow his car. Uh, well, I would like to take it for a uh, drive downtown, okay? So we can all agree, if I just take his car and go downtown, that wouldn't be okay. So I have to uh, ask Dominique, can I borrow your car? And the first thing he would say, reply with was, sure, but uh, where do, for what purpose? Well, I want to take your car downtown, okay? So for how long? Well, a couple of hours, and maybe he says, well, that's okay. So I take his car, go downtown. Now, if I want to go to, say, Idaho, because I just feel like, if I just go to Idaho with his car, I would vi violate the trust uh, he had in this agreement. So I would naturally have to ask him if that would be okay. So I call him up and say, can I drive your car to Idaho? And then he can, he can say, well, that's okay. You can go there, but for how long? Well, three days, and I go to Idaho. Now let's say I take the car for a spin on the local racing track. That would be for a complete different purpose than than Dominique thought were, uh, were the purpose of me borrowing his car and for uh, another uh, period of time. And let's say I finish up the racing, uh, uh, the racing with selling his car just because I would like to monetize on his car. Well, it's a nice car, right? And I could earn some money from that, but that's kind of stealing. This is exactly the same thing with personal data. This is what many big companies does. They collect your personal information, they use it for purposes that you might not have agreed on or you weren't clear that you agreed on that. And then they end up selling your information. Is that okay? No, it's not. So we have to change our thinking of personal data as something we borrow. And that's the purpose of the legislation. So why should you care? Besides that it should be clear that it makes sense that we are borrowing stuff, uh, but why should we care about complying with the GDPR? Well, it's always important to comply with legislation. This is how we've built our society. We have legislation that regulates the, the society and we all have to comply. But the fines can be huge. And they can be up to 4% of global annual revenue, not profit, and uh, revenue, or 20 million euros, whichever is higher. And 20 million euros is approximately 23 million US. And if you're a small business owner with this size of, uh, of fine, you will be out of this business. And for the big companies, 4% of their global annual revenue is a huge sum. The reason for this penalty frame is that EU wanted everybody to care about this. It's a fundamental human right we have to have privacy and everybody should respect that. However, in the legislation, there is an obligation to report to the authorities within 72 hours if we get a data breach. 
And I say, if we get a data breach, it's more like when we get a data breach, uh, because it's almost impossible to avoid at any time in the future. So we, we have to report to the authorities, and they will publish your data breach on their website, and there will be reporters watching that web website. And that can be very damaging to our reputation and our business, and maybe even make us uh, go out of business. Uh, more than the uh, fine that we get. But finally, we are found maker developers, right? So it also brings some business opportunities for us. So if you're a found maker developer, why would you care about the GDPR? Well, first off, I want to say that GDPR is in force in Europe, but California just approved a legislation that is named Mini GDPR, which is actually a, uh, well, they are looking very much into the GDPR. So this is highly relevant for anybody doing business in California. And I've heard that other states is uh, considering doing similar stuff. So eventually this will come to the entire world. So that's why you should really care about this stuff. But if you're a FileMaker developer, the reason you should care about this is because we are considered data processors. If we can see personal information, we are per definition data processors. Even if we didn't do any processing, data processing is in the broad term just if we can see the data. And we know we are all uh, task with, uh, assigned with tasks to do modifications in production systems where personal information reside. So it's almost impossible not to view any personal data for any of us. As data processors, we are liable to comply with the GDPR. Any company that does business with EU residents has to comply with the GDPR. But we are to some extent co-liable with the data controller. The data controller has the primary responsibility for taking good care of the uh, data and to comply with the legislation. But if we know that our customer, the data controller, is not complying with GDPR, we can be to some extent co-liable and we are talking about huge fines. So that's another very big reason why we should care as FileMaker developers, beside the business opportunities, of course. And finally, because we are data processors, there is a requirement in the legislation that we have uh, data processor agreements uh, between the data controller and the data processor. Now, from personal experiences, I've seen uh, lawyers that are working with the data controller who write up these uh, data processor agreements. And they are filling them up with all kinds of crap that has nothing to do with GDPR, all kinds of requirements that they want to impose on you. So what we did were that we draw up our own data processor agreement. There is a few requirements to what these agreements need to con uh, contain, and we put that in and nothing else, because that's what needed for a data processor agreement. And then we had our customers sign up uh, on that. If they want to put in other contractual demands, it has to be in other types of contracts. But be very careful when you see these uh, data processor agreements if you're uh, asked to sign up uh, on them, because those lawyers have a tendency to fill them up with crap that doesn't belong there. Okay, so we need to have a new way of looking on ownership uh, for personal data. The owner is the individual person. There's no doubt about that. So that means the individual person should have full control over their own personal data. We, and when I say we, then I put myself in the uh, uh, data controller's position. Say, when, when we get data, we are the data controller. We are responsible for, for complying to the GDPR requirements as well as taking good care of this information that we are borrowing from the uh, individual. And almost everybody needs 
subcontractors that might do some processing and remind you that just the mere fact that you can see the data makes you a data processor. So that could be subcontractors or it could be cloud providers where you store the data. And by the way, it's GDPR, GDPR also states that all personal data must reside physically in EU or any approved third party country. And uh, on the list of approved third party country is, uh, for example, New Zealand. But then there's, a, then there's a blacklist, and on top of that blacklist is the United States. The reason for that is because the legislation in the United States is not considered uh, taking good care of the, or respecting the privacy, the right to have privacy. There is an agreement between EU and US that will allow you to store data on US servers, uh, but that is being disputed in court. It was uh, the successor of the uh, safe harbor agreement, which were ruled illegal. The, the lawyers I've been speaking with says that it will happen again for this uh, new agreement that I can't remember the name of right now, but they say it will also be ruled illegal because it doesn't comply to the demands in GDPR itself. And then we don't have an agreement and I don't know what will happen then. Probably nobody will. So that means we really need to take care of this. Um, okay, so what kind of data is covered by GDPR? That is any person-related data, meaning that any data that in any way can be related to a real human being that is alive. So, of course, that's some, something like name and address and email address, but it's also the contact person in a company. So, say you're doing business with a company, the information about the company is not covered by GDPR. But the contact person you have in that company, the information about that contact person is covered by GDPR. Whatever information you might ha may have about that. So it also applies to resumes and applications, even if it's unsolicited. So even if you, you didn't ask for it, it is covered by GDPR. And as such, you need to take good care of it. It also applies to IP addresses, since an IP address can be related to a real human being, even if it's not easy to do, it's covered. And some geolocation data can also be uh, covered, depending on whether this uh, location data might be your uh, address, so it can be related to you, or let's say it can be related to your user profile on Facebook, uh, and uh, for example, the geolocation of where you are when you are using that uh, application. Then it's covered by GDPR. Right. So, how do we get compliance? Now, I told you what type of data is covered by GDPR, who is your owner, and we need to have these things. So, what about FileMaker? Is FileMaker GDPR compliant? Well, yes, no, and it depends, right? Don't you just love these clear answers in the legislation, okay? Well, FileMaker or any type of system cannot be GDPR compliant because compliance means that it has to be both the system and the procedures that m makes up the compliance, okay? Okay. So in order to understand the, the uh, process of the uh, getting compliance, there is some elements. So first off, there's the element of documentation. We need to document, okay? There's a principle called this security by design. Another key principle is privacy by design. In some cases, we need to specifically ask for consent. And then there's a key principle that we need to be transparent. It's written in the legislation that you should be comp uh, transparent. Okay, so what about this documentation? Well, we need to document that we are compliant. 
the only way we can document that we are compliant is by writing up a data flow description. A data flow description describes each of the processes that you have revolving around collecting and processing personal information. So you need to start with the processes for the collection and describe them in detail. And actually, you need to describe them in uh, the types of data in detail. So let's say I have a web shop and some of you would like to uh, purchase a computer. So I need some information in order to make this uh, transaction work. And by the way, when we, when we enter into agreement, like, like uh, the agreement to uh, purchase something, that, is, that term is the, a contract. So if we have a contract, it doesn't have to be a contract contract, but a sale is also a contract, okay? So I will, in, in order for me to fulfill this contract, I will need some information uh, like your name, your address, and, uh, and so on that is needed. But let's say I'm asking, uh, want to ask you, uh, so do you have a hot sister? What's her phone number? Do you have a photo? That's not relevant in order to make the sale, right? It's, it's not needed for me to fulfill the contract. Maybe I would like to know, but that's another thing. I know this example is, is a little bit out there, but, but many companies actually ask all other kinds of questions like, what's your birthday? You don't have the right to know that. It's not needed for this transaction. So that's why you need to describe all the processes in detail so you can uh, determined from the data flow description the types of data you're collecting, whether or not the, they are legal, and whether or not you need to take some actions, maybe delete those data if you already have uh, collected that. All right, so let's take the next element, security by design. There is a demand in GDPR that our systems, or actually our procedures, is secure by design which means that in terms of FileMaker systems, that's where we are lucky with a great platform because there is a bunch of great security features on the FileMaker platform. I'm specifically thinking about the uh, encryption at rest feature. Use that. Make sure that your server has SSL certificate so the traffic between the server and client is encrypted. Use the account privileges sets so you can apply granular uh, privileges to the information in the system. Consider using the uh, new feature we got last year, the field level encryption. So for example, uh, several of our clients have social security numbers in their system. Now, they work in different ways in different countries, but for example in Denmark, this is a unique identifier. If I have your social security number, it will be very easy for me to steal your identity and uh, uh, get a, a loan, for example. So this is a piece of information we need to take good care of. And by the way, we cannot get a new uh, social security number unless we change gender or if we are highly criminal and go into witness protection program, which almost never happened. So that means we cannot get a new number. We need to take extra good care of that piece of information. So we encrypt on, on the field level the social security number. So does that mean that a hacker cannot get that? No there will be ways around that, because it's, it's doable if you try hard enough. But we have prevented, let's say, the, a, an export from the uh, contacts table with social security numbers. If they were there in plain text, we wouldn't have taken good care of the uh, information, and thereby we haven't applied the principle of security by design. So use that. And consider external authentication. Uh, the reason for that is because it will give you the ability to apply two-factor authentication, which we don't have on the FileMaker platform yet, but I hope it will get there, and if enough people are voting for it, I'm sure it will get there. But right now we have the ability of using external authentication. 
and apply security best practice. The entire day has been a track of security, and if you haven't attended them, uh, check the recordings out when you get home and learn more about the uh, best security practices, because this stuff is important for so many reasons, but in terms of GDPR, it's actually a requirement that we do that. So another key principle is privacy by design. So what do we mean by that? Well, I just told you that personal data is something we borrow for a specific purpose, for a specific time frame, meaning that we have to deliver it back. In terms of delivering back means that we have to delete that data. When we don't have a legal need for that information any longer, we have to delete it. So, again, the FileMaker platform is great because you can build features that deletes these types of data. It doesn't have to be the entire record. It could be uh, just the information that we don't need. You can also um, anonymize the record so you don't break your relational databases. But please try to make them automatic so they don't rely on a person. It's much better. So consider locking outputs for documentation. So let's say that Craig uh, just downloads the, uh, or exports uh, some records from the contacts table to a spreadsheet before he go home and he puts it on his, on his laptop, takes the train, and then he loses the laptop on the train. So naturally he will call into the IT and say, I lost my computer, and by the way, I just exported some personal data. Now the clock is ticking. We only have 72 hours before we have to report to the authorities that we had a data breach, what type of data was in this breach, and how many people were affected by this. This is a requirement. If we don't lock the outputs, it will be a detective work to find out, and it will be nonstop working in 72 hours and probably more in order to uh, determine that. So really consider applying logging features for especially the output functions. And really consider limiting output to need to have instead of nice to have. I know there are several uh, systems where you can just make a plain uh, export of anything you would like to do. But when it comes to personal data, please consider limiting that. And the reason for that is we have borrowed some data. We are responsible for taking good care of that data. If any user in the system can just export that to spreadsheets, PDF, whatever, did we take good care of that? I don't think you could really, truly say that we have applied privacy by design then. All right? And also consider to limit what users can see. If you have users that don't need to see the social security number, there's no reason for them to see that. Again, remember, this is data that we borrow. We need to take good care of it. Right. So, in some occasions, we need to explicitly ask for consent. And when it comes to consent, uh, it applies for some types of data. I'll get back to the types of data in a minute, um, but uh, sometimes we need to ask for consent. And when it comes to consent, it's a requirement that they are written in a plain, simple to understand and limited to a specific use. So don't ask a lawyer to write the text for the consent. They tend to mess that up with something that nobody really understands anyways. It has to be plain and simple. And when you do that, you must inform that a consent can be withdrawn at any time. That's a requirement uh, that you can do that. And if you have a checkbox on a website in order to do the consent, there must be a checkbox on the website where you can remove that checkbox. It, it has to be just as easy to withdraw your consent as it is to give it. So it doesn't uh, work if you require them to fill out a paper form and send it via fax, and then within three months you may consider removing their consent. No, it has to be uh, just as easy. And then you have to inform 
the uh, individual about the identity of the data controller. And that makes perfectly sense. If I give my personal data to someone, I need to know who's responsible for taking good care of this. So these are the requirements. There is a few more. I'm not going to go into details. Normally, I use two hours on these talks. And today, we don't have that much time. So the types of data. There are four categories of, of uh, data types. The first one is the common data. So that means name, journal number, customer number, contact details, gender, age, interests, customer profiles, purchase history, credit information, and IP addresses. Uh, these are common data, and the, these are information that you usually need in order to fulfill a contract. So you don't need to ask for consent. Well, again, to the example, if you buy something in my web shop, there is the contact information that I really need. But if I ask about your sister or her phone number, that is not relevant. So I don't have a legal reason for us uh, to ask for that. If I would like to have that information, I will need your explicit consent. And I have to inform about what my purpose of uh, collecting that data is. Okay. So mostly, you don't need explicit consent for this information. Then the next uh, type of data is sensitive data. And here we are talking about race, ethnic background, religion, political beliefs, workers, union relations, medical information, sexual preferences, genetic data, and biometric data. Pretty much always, and there's, well, there's no always yes and no in legislation, right? So that's why I say pretty much always you need consent to collect and store this data. It's not that if I just ask for it, then it's OK. No, you need to have a legal reason for collecting this data. You could have, but that's something you have to determine in the process of uh, becoming compliant. So a, a, uh, an interesting thing is that if I have a photo of Craig, and I store that, that's common data. Now, if I go and apply, for example, facial recognition on that photo, the photo changes to a biometric information, and then it's a sensitive data. So if I want to apply facial recognition, I need to ask for Craig's consent, okay? So, the third category is private data. So that's uh, information like uh, criminal records, serious social problems, other private information like personality tests, uh, divorces, adoption information, a positive alcohol and drug tests. These are really private data. And you shouldn't ask for that. Uh, but if you do and you think you have a legal reason for it, you really, you always need consent, unless, let's say you run a prison, you shouldn't ask the inmates for consent to store their criminal records, right? So there's a weighing, ground, a weighing reason for you to store and process the criminal records, even though it's in the private category, okay? So the, the last one is social security number. So that is a separate category that is handled differently in, the, in each uh, country uh, because of the different uses. But it's the only thing in that category. So this is the types of data. Uh, and from this, you can see in your data flow description how to take actions on the data you already have and to the processes that uh, you want to implement. Now, the documentation is not only for becoming compliant. The documentation is something that has to live on forever. And you need to update it as your business uh, changes and uh, go in and update that. So with that, I'm actually, oh yeah, I managed to do this faster than uh, I was supposed to. It's probably just because you're all sleeping anyways. 
No, because you can look at GDPR as a requirement and something that is boring and it's a burden to do that. But most of our clients, well, actually all of our clients have accept, well, we have to accept the fact that we have to do this. But if we turn the process from being a requirement and a burden to, hey, we are actually going to analyze our processes, and then we are already on the way to optimize our workflow. So we have taken this process into a positive thing and say, let's use this process in order to optimize the workflows, which is what we try to accomplish every single day as FileMaker developers anyway. So this is actually perfect, uh, a perfect reason to review the workflow and the processes and to optimize them. But when we are FileMaker developers, we can also see this as a business opportunity. So there's a bunch of opportunities here. Well, I just said it's the demand that we can create a data flow description. You can do that on paper or spreadsheet or Word documents, but why not build a FileMaker custom ad? It's perfect for that. I talked about logging features, log what's, uh, what outputs you get. Well, you have to build those features into the systems, another business opportunity. Document systems, we need to make sure that we know where the documents are if they have personal data. We can use that in FileMaker. What about the data exchange platform? Well, emails have been used extensively to email all types of data. An email is like an open postcard. It's not security by design. So that means with the GDPR, there's no more emailing personal data. We cannot do that. So we need to find another way of doing it. And we can build a data exchange platform in FileMaker, with container fields, WebDirect, okay? And mobile apps for collecting information so that they don't flow within emails or through the camera roll. So a few examples of what we have uh, been building uh, and uh, is in the process of uh, doing with our customers. So the data flow descript uh, description solution is actually a pretty simple solution uh, that we offer to our customers. We didn't go out and build a solution that we tried to sell and market as a vertical, vertical app, uh, merely because we are extremely busy, so uh, we didn't have the time to productize it. It's hosted on their server because it's their documentation. And they are responsible for filling in the information. They are responsible for updating the information because it's their GDPR documentation. And documents, for example, the uh, data process agreements with the different uh, providers, they upload that to, the uh, to the, this solution. So they have all the GDPR documentation contained in this app. Uh, and they already have a FileMaker server, so it's merely just upload the file and, uh, and then more people can uh, get access. So as you can see, it's pretty simple. Well, I only put in one process, but on the left side, we have a list of processes. And then for each process, well, there's a name. What is it? Uh, how often does it happen? Which system is it uh, going to? And by system, I mean not only a digital system, but it could be paper as well, because we need to describe all the processes that uh, contains personal data. And then each piece of information, so for example, the contact person name could be the address, the email, and so on, because we need to determine for each piece of information the legality. Is it okay to ask for Craig's sister's name, or her phone number, or if she's hot? We need to document that here, what the legality is, and then we have to have a deletion policy. That's a requirement to write up a deletion policy, but you cannot do that before you have described all the processes in detail and determined how long can we store this information, how long is needed. And for example, for financial data, you have to store that for, in Denmark it's five years, in Germany it's 10 years, and in 
it's different in, in each country. Uh, so there's a, another legislation that says you have to store the, this uh, data for X time. But we have to document that we have stored this for X time because of this policy, okay? So it's very simple and uh, this is just the screen uh, with the list of systems where basically what is the system, who's responsible for this system. And uh, well, you can put in some notes, but if it's uh, external vendors, then you need the uh, data process agreement. But you know, this is something that is dead simple and any one of you can do this in, I would say five minutes, maybe a little bit more, but it's very simple to do, right? Okay, so another of our customers is uh, the biggest music venue in Denmark. They have uh, three stages and they have approximately 150 employees who are employed by the hour, which means that they uh, go in and take shifts uh, during concerts uh, as a bartender or doing ticketing or a wardrobe. And uh, they do that uh, beside their studies. So there's a lot of... Uh, exchange in the, in, uh, in the group of people here. And uh, that also means that they get a lot of resumes and, um, and applications every year and they get them by email. But we have to stop that because email is an open postcard, it's personal data, and even if we get it, we are still responsible as soon as we get it. So what we are doing instead, and we're not finished doing that, but we are building a job portal where the job seekers go to a website where they create a job profile. And there they have to fill out information that is relevant for the process of determining whether or not they should be hired. Instead of having resumes with free form text that in this case is not really relevant, it's much easier to have a, a f specific fields and check boxes they can fill out uh, to determine whether or not they should be hired or at least interviewed. Um, so that also optimizes the process of recruiting new people. So this is actually a benefit. Since we have to take care of the, the, this data, we're building this solution. That's the reason for doing it, but it will also greatly optimize the process of recruiting. Another thing is that the job seekers profile will automatically be deleted. After six months, it will be deleted unless, uh, unless they are hired, of course. And they know that when they apply for a job. And if they are hired, then we need some additional information. So for example, when they fill out the profile at, uh, at first, we don't ask for banking account uh, information or social security number, because that's not relevant at this stage. We don't need that. We need some other information to determine whether or not we should hire this person. But if they are hired, then we need their banking information so we can send them their paycheck. And we need their social security number so we can report to the tax authorities uh, how much they earned. And that information flows back to the greater FileMaker backend system where it's used. And we are using access via WebDirect. It's perfect for that. So the data exchange platform is, uh, is a separate, well, it's, it's a FileMaker solution, but it can be tightly integrated, tightly integrated with the customer's existing system. Um, and that means that when they have, for example, we have a model agency, and uh, when they send their models to uh, jobs in uh, foreign countries, they typically need a flight ticket. And they have to send uh, a photo of their passport to the travel agency so they can book the tickets and all, uh, do all the paperwork. So there's a real reason to exchange personal data with the travel agency, but we have to do it in a secure way. So they go to the models, uh, to the models records, uh, where uh, there is a photo of the uh, passport. They press a button, it gets pushed over to the data exchange platform. We send an email to the uh, travel agency so they can log in and they can download that information. But not only that, but when they do that, we log that they go log into the system as well as each file they download. So we have a complete log of 
the information we have passed on to a third party. So that's also a major reason for doing this data exchange platform. And it's hosted on their FileMaker server already. Uh, it's used to exchange all kinds of data, even though it was uh, meant to be only for uh, personal data. And all use is locked, and the receiver gets a time-limited account so that, they don't, uh, so that they are not able to go in and download over and over again. And again, this is WebDirect, which is perfect for that. So it could look like this, where uh, the travel agency goes to the login page, and they log in with their time-limited account. They can go in and find the file that they need to download. Uh, and well, this is just WebDirect. Now it's locked that they did download a file. But not only that, now the travel agency has booked the ticket and they need to share that back to us. So they have the ability to create a virtual folder in the system, give it a name and some description, and then they are able to go in and just drag and drop over there. For example, this was the boarding pass, maybe a thought up example. So now they can share the boarding pass back to, to the model agency. And that is done by, well, just clicking there. This is just an example. You can go and do the same thing, right? You can build that for your customers, or you can even build that for several customers. This is just an idea, right? So I talked about the model agency. They go out uh, at festivals uh, in the cities and go and scout for new models. That's a, a process they are doing all the time. When they find someone, a good-looking girl or boy, they ask them, of course, if they were, uh, would be interested in becoming a model. And if they agree, they need to collect some personal information. They need to get their name and, uh, and uh, birthday, as well as taking some images. So this information they collect on their iPhone, they cannot send that via email because that's not secure. Then we would break the legislation. And taking images on their phone to the camera roll would flow to iCloud, which will probably flow to American servers and could be obtained on other computers uh, and so on. So that's also like I said, it's common data, but it's also personal data. So we need to take care of that. Luckily, we have FileMaker, where we can build mobile apps. Um, and both the data and images are contained within FileMaker, which means that, that we control the flow. The company, the model agency control the flow. The data is sent to the, ser to the FileMaker server where other people determine whether or not this particular person is interesting enough to become a model. So it looks like this where uh, each scout person goes in and create a new record. And this is actually much greater than just using the notes application or an email application because we can utilize different features within the uh, FileMaker Go where, uh, as you can see, uh, for example, we can correct this, uh, the proper, well, uh, capital letters. Uh, we can apply spacing uh, to uh, phone numbers so it's easier to read. Uh, the birthday. Uh, and when you have filled in the birthday, we calculate the age of the model. Uh, you can do notes and um, uh, that goes to the people who has to decide whether or not they should become models or they should uh, look into becoming models. And uh, then finally, you can take uh, photos and these photos is also included in the upstream to the server. Sorry for being so slow on the video, but, but everything is contained within a FileMaker app. This is actually a fairly simple app. The most complicated part was to use the data API to upload to the server, which wasn't even complicated. But I mean, then we have the stuff, just 
click on the upload button, and then they send the data to the server immediately. And then there's no more need for having the records on the iPhone. So now we have applied security best practice, privacy by design, and we are taking good care of data that we are borrowing. So this is just a few examples on how we have uh, been trying to, uh, to do stuff that will help our customers. So if you're still awake, any questions? Please go to the microphones uh, because the session is recorded. I have a hmm? question about the right to be forgotten. Yes. Um, do you, are you aware of a timeline that exists? Is yes, it, yes, yes. Well, yeah, well, I forgot to mention, <laughs> no. Just feel free I to didn't, expand on that. I, I didn't forgot to mention. Uh, I chose not to go into detail, but yes, there is um, a very key principle in the GDPR that you as an individual have the right to be forgotten. And since we have a little time, I want to tell just a little background on that. So, uh, some years ago, there were a, uh, a student in Switzerland uh, who were writing a major assignment on privacy and data in general. And he went, uh, he, he went and deleted his Facebook profile and thought that he had really deleted his profile. Uh, but then he asked uh, Facebook, to, uh, to give him his, uh, everything they knew about him. And as far as I know, he actually took this into court where Facebook were uh, ruled to give him this data. And they actually printed that out on paper and they had to bring a full pallet of information that were related to him. And he did delete his profile, right? So. The lawmakers in EU said, well, we can't have that. You, you have to have the right to be forgotten. So, which means that if you delete your Facebook profile, it should indeed be deleted. It doesn't work that your data is still flowing within the Facebook system. So that's the reason for the right to be forgotten. Well, that and a few other examples with, uh, for example, Google. You have to have the right to be forgotten, which means that uh, taking to the full extent means that if any of the people where you have their personal data uh, tell you that they want to exercise their right to be forgotten, you are required to delete their information. Unless, if it's financial data, you're required by another legislation to keep that for five years or 10 years, for example. Or, um, uh, what's it called, uh, when you're washing money, money laundering laws, right? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, they have other requirements that you have to log information, uh, financial information. So it's, it's not very easy, but let's say someone say they want to exercise their right to be forgotten. In your CRM system, then you have no reason to store that information anymore. So you have to delete it there, but it has to be in the financial system for another reason in, in another legislation. Was that answer enough? Exactly. So, well, the question or comment is, what about the backups, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> this is an interesting thing. Um, it applies to backups as well. So, if you have the right to be forgotten and you want to exercise that right, we have to delete in the production system and in every single backup copy. Now, that's not fun to do to say it at least in FileMaker, because you have to open every single file and go in manually, more or less manually, and find the data and delete them from the backup. So what we did instead uh, of, uh, of trying to make our process, because we have no tool for that, we have no FileMaker tool for doing this. So we wrote in our uh, deletion policy that, that the deletion means that we have a retention period of typically six months in the backup. So we have written in, in the uh, uh, deletion policies that within, after six months, it will be deleted completely from also all the backups. 
whether or not that is good enough, it has to be disputed in court. So I cannot say that, but, but the GDPR clearly states that it's what's reasonable uh, also in terms of time, technology, and uh, financially. So we don't have to apply, well, unreasonable resources to do that. So let's say you have to go back in 200 backup copies, and then you can spend a week on that. That is not reasonable. So that's the reason why we believe that it must be okay to write it in, in the deletion policy that we have the retention period of uh, six months. Okay? Yes? Uh, this is around the deletion and disclosure and whether internally generated comments about a data subject are subject to GDPR. So the modeling agency was a great example. I think afterwards their staffers are going to be making assessments about these models, sometimes sure. negative comments. Sure. Do the models have the right to ask for disclosure of sure. that? Is, can you keep anything confidential from a data subject as part of your business process? Uh, yes and yes. So yes to that, for example, the model has the right to get full disclosure. But if there are valid business reasons for omitting some type of information, uh, that, that will be legal to omit some of that. But which type and to where, where do you draw the line, that is something that you would need to take up with an attorney. And if you ask 10 different lawyers, you will get 10 different answers, unfortunately. In five years, there will probably have been uh, lawsuits and, and, uh, and best practices, so we will all be more, uh, uh, know better. Yeah, well, waiting for precedent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes? I had another follow-up question about the model example, because yeah. it's out in the field and it's um, like the the user or the data subject isn't entering their own data, like over a browser sure. or something. Yeah. So I was just wondering, like thinking through like um, documenting consent and like verifying consent, especially for your documentation. I don't know if you could speak to any sure. of that. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's a very good reason that we don't ask for consent here, mm. because what we are collecting is common data. It's common information that we don't need consent for as long as we can document the legality. So the name and address and contact details are all needed. The birthday is also needed. And we have a valid reason for that. And of course the images is as well. So we don't need to ask for specific con uh, consent on that. When they become model, we need to get their measurements. So we need to get their breast size, which is a highly private information. Although, in this case of the models, it's also uh, a product description, because the model becomes a product, so the breast size is a product description. So this makes it a little bit uh, different uh, again. But before we get those things, we are, uh, they are required to sign contracts, and those uh, model contracts is in uh, essence also the consent to, well, we need to collect some data because that's needed, okay? Was that good enough or? Yes. Okay, Craig? Um, with the storage, can you, so you said you can't, well, uh, USA is not approved storage location, but what about a US company that's got, like Amazon in, in Australia, say? Yeah. If you can store that in Australia, for example, or? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, that's, that's interesting. It has to be physically stored within right. EU, unless, 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 right? Yeah. Um, so for Amazon, for example, you store your, well, you buy an instance in a region that is a physical, uh, uh, in a physical region. You don't need to know the exact lo uh, address of that data center, for example, but we know, for example, in, uh, we are using uh, Frankfurt. Uh, so we know it's in Frankfurt and that's in our documentation and that's within EU, so that's okay. But the region is 
is pretty much uh, secluded from the rest of the Amazon network. Mm -hmm. uh, the Amazon, uh, Amazon does not copy data, not either in the background to uh, other data centers. Um, and just another quick question on a different yeah. topic. Google Analytics on a website is collecting data on people hitting your website, and who knows where that goes. Um, yeah. Should we be worried about that, or? I think so. Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> personally, I think so, because we, we, we never know where, where things flow flow, right, uh, un, un, unless they tell us to. So what's the correct thing? Is it to get consent to, to say that this website uses analytics? Of oh, the analytics? Uh, <laughs> yeah, good question. <laughs> I, have, I don't have a good answer to that. Uh, well, if you, if, you, if you clearly state that, uh, that's, that's another requirement that, that if you're using Google statistics or whatever, you have to uh, specify that. But that's actually the cookie policy, which is yet another legislation, uh, which is kind of the same as the GDPR, because some private informa personal information flows to something, and you have to accept uh, cookies. Uh, but, but there's a separate cookie legislation, uh, at least in EU. I'm not sure if that applies in right. other countries. I'm not sure. Right. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah. And the last question, even though over time, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so um, how about when they offer you information? So, for example, in the, in the job, you said jobs yeah. where they were just filling in a form. Yeah. But in the situation that I have where it's an executive search firm and they do in fact send in resumes and they put all kinds of crap on there exactly. that I don't need to know, exactly. but they put it on there. Sure. So, uh, Even um, medical information. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, and social security numbers, yeah. you know, yeah. things like yeah. that. So yeah. um, just a, sort of a question about that. Um, and then um, also just a little bit confusion about in the very beginning when you said the U.S. is not, we're on the blacklist. Mm -hmm. So. So what do I? <laughs> so do I? What well, do I do well, about that? <laughs> well, the thing, yeah. Well, well, the thing is that that uh, yeah, it, it's a little bit confusing because there is an agreement between EU and US about it can be okay if if the business within US uh, 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 complies to certain uh, to certain requirements. Um, however, uh, this law is disputed. Uh, the thing is that that the GDPR applies to residents of EU. So if you're doing anything with residents of EU, then you have to comply with the GDPR uh, in, in general, which means that, that you need to take good care of, of the information and you're borrowing it and you cannot store it forever and you cannot sell it, you cannot uh, use it for other purposes. So you have to uh, respect that even if you're a US business. Uh, of course, you can store it on your servers that are located in US. Uh, otherwise, it, it, it wouldn't make sense. Uh, and that's covered by the agreement that might be ruled illegal. And then we have a new situation. Uh, yeah, uh, sorry, it's, it's not that clear and simple. But you're absolutely true about the, uh, the application and, and resumes. I've also seen resumes uh, sent to our company with all kinds of deeply personal information that was, oh shit, don't want to look at it because it's, it's none of my business whatsoever. Uh, but as soon as I receive it, I have the responsibility. So that's why the, the uh, venue, the music venue, they reject anything on email and you're sent to the, this website in order to prevent getting these resumes with all kinds of information that we don't need. Okay. So we have to change our process. And when we do so, in, in this case, we actually optimize the workflow uh, and make it better. All right, so we are out of time. Uh, feel free to catch me anytime you see me, uh, if you have questions, or send me an email. Thank you very much for coming, and please fill out the evaluation.